Welcome. Thank you for joining this lightning talk session on equity in course and assessment design. We have two chat options, one on the right hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize the questions for our speakers, we would like for you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose. But <laughs> we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. To help our moderator, uh, if you are asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of your question. It makes it easier when we're scrolling through trying to identify the questions. At this time, I'd like to hand it off to our moderator, Gloria Niles, and we'll get started. Thank you, Norma, and welcome everybody to our lightning session on equity in course and assessment design. We're delighted to have our two speakers for this session. First, we have Dr. Regina Henry, who is a change agent in the field of education, and she aims to lift every voice of every student in her professional administrative practices. She spent 11 years of her career in corporate America and transitioned to K-12 education and landed in higher education where she's been living her best life for the past 18 years with serving students. Her career, she has several career highlights, but she's currently uh, the Dean of Programs for Strayer University, where she is responsible for architecting the student journey. And our second presenter today is Dr. Kevin Kelly, who teaches online courses as a lecturer in the Department of Equity, Leadership Studies, and Instructional Technologies at San Francisco State University, where he also previously served as the online teaching and learning manager. He worked with colleges and universities as a consultant to address distance education, educational technology, organizational change, and learning equity. He is the co-author of the 2021 stylist book, Advancing Online Teaching, Creating Equity-Based Digital Learning and Environments. And I believe our first speaker today is Dr. Henry. So I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm here to talk to you about why assessment design is a diversity issue. And I look forward to sharing what I've learned as a facilitator of learning, also as an instructional designer. Next slide, please. So if you'd like to type in chat, please type away. I have just a few quick shots or slides throughout this session that will ask you questions and ask you to share your thoughts so that you can be engaged in the presentation. So the first question is, have you ever quit a course or a degree program because of an assessment? If so, why? And if you'll type your comments in the chat, I'll just let you go ahead and go away. You don't, uh, you know, type your response right away and we'll advance to the next slide. So, underrepresented students often feel defeated before they have a chance to start. It may be a myriad of things that make them feel this way. It could be a lack of background knowledge, connection to the instruct instructor or peers, or access to the supports that help them succeed. In the scenario that you're seeing on the screen, I was that student. I walked into a physics course and didn't have the proper foundation to be successful. I had no idea that the subject would be so intense at the onset. Underrepresented students can be minorities, female students, or students with language barriers, or students that have instructional gaps or disabilities. I was that student in terms of not having the background knowledge. I was a female. I was a minority. I quickly changed my major. In that scenario above, um, what I can say is when you're a facilitator of learning in the classroom, one of the things that we have a responsibility to do is to read the classroom, to know when a student may be entirely lost and provide just-in-time support. Maybe it's an announcement on your board or in your course 
uh, room that says that I can see that some of you all are feeling lost. Here's a way to get support. Come to my office hours, come to tutoring, come to supplemental instruction, or whatever it might be to help that learner succeed. Next slide. So basically, just in my situation, I quit before I started. I was uh, early in my college experience. I changed my major. This is the same thing that can happen with a poor assessment strategy. It has the same effect on students. It can block a student from their chosen field, career field and cause the learner to give up and feel defeated. Next slide. However, a good assessment strategy can extend a hand. It can help learners believe in themselves and believe in their ability to be successful. And it prevents a student from feeling defeated. Next slide. So what are key facets of a good assessment strategy to you? If you'll type that in the chat and just share your thoughts. And we'll advance to the next slide. And I'll just, clarity and transparency, one that embraces universal design. Scaffold, very good. I like those comments that are coming in. So a good assessment strategy has the opposite effect. It allows students to uh, feel connected. You can see that I have four uh, items on the screen and I will go through each of those around a good assessment strategy. So if we go, go to the next slide. In terms of compassion, we're gonna talk about it. Next slide. So first off, we've got three points here. Keeping an open mind. What we wanna know is generalities are dangerous to the learning community. Sometimes our assessment strategy assumes that the playing field is equal and equitable to all learners. We all come from different walks of life, which should be top of mind when we're preparing to assess. Some students have exposures that other students may not have been afforded. The teaching and learning community should be a safe space to help budding professionals grow and development, develop. It should not be an opportunity to weed out learners. Some of us are guilty of looking at education and teaching students from this lens. I've even said in my classroom, some of you all will not make it. I will say that my thinking has changed um, as I've remained in the field of education because my job and my responsibility is to make sure that I am assessing what students should know should be able to do and demonstrate. And what I do know is that not every learner that enters my classroom has had the same experiences. And so a student that is a person of color may not have necessarily been a student who's lived an impoverished life. Oftentimes when we see students, we make assumptions. Sometimes with students, they come from all different walks of life. So we should have that top of mind when we're preparing to assess. Teaching and the teaching and learning community should be a safe space to help underrepresented students have a fair shot at gaining knowledge, skills, and abilities to demonstrate their competency. Next slide. Some students have attended urban schools where teachers are often not certified to teach in the subject area that they're teaching. Teachers in uh, urban schools tend to take more days off or have less experience. In turn, if they are absent often, that means our learners may have had more substitute teachers or a teacher that is not, um, as qualified as someone that is certified in the field that they're teaching. So we wanna uh, try approaching teaching and learning with an attitude that all students can learn with the proper supports. Some students attended some of the best K-12 schools in the country. We have to meet them where they are. And some students may have been passed along, which means that there are deficiencies in their learning. 
We have to look at all those things when we're considering and planning and creating assessments. So when students enter your class, think about how you might uh, help them succeed rather than how they will not succeed. I can remember uh, times where I felt like there were faculty who predestined me for failure, or even, and I say me for failure, but more specifically being a mother of an African-American son, I can remember in his kindergarten experience, two weeks in, the teacher had a meeting about week six or eight with me and my husband and said that my son lacked the maturity for kindergarten success. So she had predestined him for failure at the onset. So remember how our lens frames how we assess and how our students learn. So next slide, please. We have to recognize that all students can learn. We have to witness their struggle. We have to get to know them. We have to strive to connect with them. We have to try to see things from their perspective. Don't avoid teaching students or helping students who seem disengaged or disinterested. We know we never know what the student has faced before they entered our learning community. So their perceptions about their learning experience are their reality. Be willing to be vulnerable and be ready to hear what your students have to say about your teaching style and your assessment strategies and strive to um, do better when you're no, when you are aware that you are not connecting. Ask for feedback. The best faculty have an ear to hear and a heart to listen. Show interest in the students that you're, that you're serving. Avoid only reaching out to students that look like you. Try to challenge yourself to connect and see the potential in students that don't look like you and that, that may not share the same background as you. Next slide. Every student is unique. Their worldview and their lived experiences are not going to be precisely the same. Each student will not have the same background knowledge or the braveness to ask for help. Strive to incorporate ways for students to feel included, feel a sense of belongingness. And when, you, when they feel those things, they'll feel more connected which will help them in terms of being better prepared to approach and ask questions to be prepared. Try something different. Ask early and plan early in terms of your uh, assessment strategies. Help students bring their lived experiences into the learning community. The more we can help students realize that they are not empty vessels and that they have something relevant to contribute to the learning community, the more likely they are to take an interest in what is being taught, which in turn means that they're more likely to perform better on the assessment. Next slide, please. Next up is authentic authenticity, excuse me. Next slide. So authenticity, basically students should know how the content connects with events or world situations from the real world. The goal should be to make the learning relevant to what they see, hear, and interact with in the world. It helps drive their desire to learn when they know the content is relevant and has currency to what's happening around them. So, that's one way to think about how to assess students. Think about how is the content relevant to what they would actually do on the job. So number, uh, the next slide, please, I'm sorry. Another way to potentially assess a learner is a simulation. A simulation provides an opportunity for experiential learning. It helps students demonstrate what they know and how to do it. And they uh, really, ex in it also a simulation will expose their gaps in their learning. It's authentic. It allows students to experience something that may occur in the workplace. It gives them a chance to decide and choose a course of actions. Oftentimes, uh, students 
minority students appreciate those things that give them the real world experiential um, connection because they want to know how it's relevant to what they will actually do on a job. Next slide. Another way that you might assess a student learning, a student learning is scenarios and case studies. The scenario can be a proposal to solve a problem. Scenarios can be an assessment created to ask students to research a topic and provide data and evidence to support their answers. Scenarios help students tap into the knowledge that they are building in the subject they're studying. Students will get the opportunity to solve a real problem. In terms of case studies, case studies actually present real issues to learners and it gives them a chance to look at something that has been experienced and put their thinking and their um, background knowledge as well as the content knowledge that they're gaining in the classroom into practice to solve a problem or to provide solutions to a case study. Next slide. Authenticity is also important. And students can shadow, they can engage in internships or interviewing. A way to assess this is to have the student go shadow a professional, learn about what it would be like working in that particular uh, real world uh, environment and get, get an understanding of a day in the life in the role. Students are equipped to determine use cases uh, for what they're learning in the course. And they can present what they've learned in the form of a paper or an essay or some presentation. Next slide. And the third item that we're going to discuss is agency. Next slide. So agency just gives our students voice and choice, how they wanna learn the topic, how they wanna demonstrate their competency. And it gives them a great way to determine their path to demonstrating their competency. Next slide. Give them opportunities for creativity. Students um, have an opportunity to choose how they solve the problem. Maybe it's interviewing a professional, as we talked about in the past slide. Maybe it's creating a portfolio to address the issue, but allow students to be in the driver's seat for solving an issue through their assessment. Next slide. Is that the next slide? Or is that, the, is that the last slide? That is the last slide. Okay, so as, as I hasten to a close, uh, some of the points that I touched on, and, and I will close out here, remember to think of ways to afford students an opportunity to demonstrate their learning, through an authentic evidence of knowledge and skills in terms of the three domains of learning. Partner with your students, partner with your instructional designers, partner with those that help you ass uh, create assessments that really give students opportunities to demonstrate their knowledge, skills, and abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henry, and we'll now turn it over to Dr. Talley. Thank you. And I don't know if Norma is able to bring the slides back up or if we have some technical difficulties, but I can just start chatting until we're ready. So um, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here, and thanks to WCET for putting this all together and for uh, Norma and Dr. Niles and Dr. Henry for paving the way for me to talk about equity here. Dr. Henry talked about compassion, authenticity, 
agency and transparency. And you probably won't be surprised, but some of those themes are gonna emerge from what I say too. I usually take a, a AAA approach, I like to say, awareness. We need to know what our students are going through, that compassion that Dr. Henry talked about. Then we need to do something about it. It's not enough to be aware of the equity-based challenges the students face. And then we need to assess not only in our courses, but the results of our actions. And so that AAA is the way I'll frame our conversation. And so uh, normally I like to put myself into context. I like to talk a little bit about what gives me privilege. I'm a white male. I was born in the US. I'm not a first generation student. Um, things that don't give me privilege. I'm a part-time lecturer at San Francisco State University. I started working when I was 14, so I can empathize with the students in my classes. 80% of the students at San Francisco State work at least half time. So I can put myself in their shoes, but I really love what Dr. Henry had to say about making sure that we're reaching out and getting to know the needs of all of our students, not just the ones that look like us. I got involved in uh, the equity work primarily based on things that my students taught me, as well as um, my work with colleges and data. And you know, since it seems like we may be having some challenges, I'm just going to share my screen so I can show you some slides while we're going here. Might as well take charge of the situation, right? There we go. So a couple examples from my experience. Uh, as an early teacher, I wanted students to, uh, they, they were turning in their assignments. Some of you may have experienced this as well as teachers using every format known to humankind. They were turning in Apple Pages and Microsoft Word and Oracle open document format. And I, I, I told them, I, I can't open all of your files. Use whatever you like to create it, but then please save it as a PDF so that I can open it and give you a score. And with my rubric, which I know Anne Prime Monahan said in the chat that she loves and some other folks brought that up too. Well, right after I made that email to my students, I got a reply from a student who says, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm living in my car right now. I'm, I'm taking your course, which is called How to Learn with Your Mobile Device um, from my iPhone. And I don't have a way to save things as PDF. What should I do? And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I just created a barrier for this student. Everybody, forget what I said. Use whatever you need to um, submit your work and I will figure it out on my end. And for that particular student, I said, if you want to use Google Docs, you're, you can... Um, use Dragon Naturally Speaking and speak your paper and have it converted into words. Um, and then since then, I've started getting a Google Voice phone number, which is free. And I have a voice mailbox where students can write their essay with pen and paper and then read it as a voicemail message. And I can give them the same score using the same rubric um, for my, for. but that student in that housing insecurity situation where many of our students find themselves at some point in their college career, um, it impacts their ability to access technology or use specific tools. We need to be aware of these things. And then I had a first generation student tell me that he benefited from my use of parent assignment template. Again, calling back to Dr. Henry's discussion of transparency, but in a slightly different way. Also, because I do consult with colleges and universities around the country, I've been working with a community college district in Oakland, California, and the state has these statistics. And you can see the dotted line and the dashed line are getting closer and closer together. They're around 5% or so different. And that those lines represent student success rates, the students who complete and pass courses in traditional courses on the top line and online courses in the one below it. But you can see when you take those averages and disaggregate it by ethnicity, by students who are first generation, by students who are low socioeconomic status, you can see that there are disparities. There are education debt gaps. Uh, so we need to be aware that not all students 
um, perform as well in certain environments. And that may be because of things that we can do. The Peralta team took this information and in their very first distance education plan, they decided that they wanted to um, address these equity challenges and they even operationally define equity as freedom from biases, assumptions, and institutional barriers that negatively impact students' motivation, opportunities, and achievement. When we started looking around for tools that we could help instructors take a look at their courses and identify equity-based challenges, there were none. So we ended up creating a rubric. I'm looking at you again, Anne, <laughs> because you love rubrics and so do I. Um, we'd created a rubric that would help instructors take a look at their course along eight different areas that the research tells us um, are equity challenges. Technology, student resources and support, universal design for learning, diversity and inclusion, images and representation, human bias, content meaning, which we heard Dr. Henry talk about with respect to authenticity, can students relate to the, the material, and then connection and belonging. Do students believe that they should be there? And do they feel connected to the, their fellow students, to the instructors, and to the institution? Since we developed, and you can see we're on version three now with this equity rubric, uh, that for the course level, I've been interested in also identifying how we can think outside the box and support institutions, staff members, campus leaders who are working with students, not when they're in their courses, but still thinking about these equity challenges. And so because this is a lightning talk, I can't talk about all eight of these research-based topics here. So you can see I've highlighted three and I'm gonna talk about them at both the course and the institution levels. And thank you, uh, Danielle, for putting the link to the equity rubric in the chat. And for those who are interested, uh, we also have, uh, there we are. Uh, I want to make sure everybody knows that there's an online equity training that's free. It's in the Canvas Commons if you want to um, work with your faculty to develop an understanding of these eight uh, equity challenge areas and ways that you can address them. Uh, take a look at that. So at the course level, when we think about technology, I told you about a student of mine who was living in his car. And uh, we also know that 20 to 25 percent of students, not just during the pandemic, but period, don't have reliable access to stable internet connection. You can see here the pictures I've put on this slide are a student sitting in their car working on a laptop. And I just did this last week when my AT&T U-verse went out after the atmospheric river hit California. I was sitting in my car for hours at a time at a Starbucks parking lot so I could have Wi-Fi and participate in conference presentations like this one um, because that was my only way to stay connected. Now I live in California. Imagine if you're in South Dakota in the winter having to get internet connectivity from your car, possibly with children who are having a snow day from school. That's, that's wild. So we need to identify our students' needs. And uh, again, hearkening back to what Dr. Henry was talking about and getting to know our students, it could be as simple as doing a survey at the beginning of your semester or a course um, to make sure that you understand what technology they have, what technology skills they have, because sometimes our returning students may need to upskill with respect to the technologies we use in our courses, even things that we take for granted, like the learning management system. Also making it possible for students who do have to drive to specific locations to get Wi-Fi, create packets where they can download things quickly. These PowerPoints that are three or four megabytes, we need to reduce the size of the images in our um, presentations so the students can download things quickly and take them back home and work with them. We also need, if we're gonna record our lectures, to provide audio cues for those students who might be listening to it while they're riding their bike to work, while they're washing the dishes and aren't able to look at um, what we're saying. So it's pretend that you're giving an audio book when you're giving a lecture. And it doesn't mean that you have to tell students everything that's on the slide, although universal design for learning would argue that we should, but giving them cues about the different things that you're talking about. 
also considering multiple file formats. So if you save something as uh, an MP4 video, uh, then also saving it as a MP3 audio or something like that. Um, making sure that we test things on mobile devices. A large number of students, maybe their only device or their primary device, they're doing a lot of work on smartphones and tablets. And we need to make sure that the things we're asking them to do, including assessment, um, work on those devices. And then providing just-in-time tutorial links for students who need help with the technology. Oops. So at the institution level, what can we do to support students who have challenges with technology access or uh, knowledge? We can borrow some ideas from K-12 where they sometimes have community-based homework hotspots. We can identify at agencies that do subsidized low-cost broadband, um, mobile hotspot programs, mobile-friendly campus websites, different things that we can do to support our students when they have technology challenges. During the pandemic, the state senate of students senate for the California Community Colleges had a survey and then a follow-up webinar, a panel of students. And one student said she was grateful that her institution provided her with a laptop during the pandemic, but it took four weeks for her to get it. And she almost had to drop all of her classes. She had to borrow laptops from neighbors until they were able to get that together. So being ready for the student need, and I don't know how you can be ready for a pandemic, but uh, now we know. So you can see all these different aspects of making sure that our institutions are prepared to support students who have technology needs, uh, whether it be the cost of the materials that we are asking students to consume through open educational resources, or making sure we have after hour tech help in their, um, with the help desk. The transparency that, um, Dr. Henry brought up is what led me to the transparent assignment template by the Transparency in Learning and Teaching or TILT Higher Ed Group. Um, the template has a number of um, aspects to it, and I like to think of it as the what are we doing, the process of the assignment and the expectations, why are we doing it, um, how it links to the learning outcomes, and how can you be successful doing it? These are the resources you need, like a rubric or a checklist or an example from other students. But we can also expand that template to support our students by allowing them to submit work in multiple formats, helping them make connections to the, their professional goals and their personal lives, and providing levels of support that may not be intuitive. How are we helping them find tutors, librarians, the different things that they'll need to su succeed with the assignments and assessments that we're asking them to perform, all the way to mental health professionals from campus or campus uh, supported organizations so that students who are experiencing anxiety with assessments are able to move forward. And that same level of support we can provide at the institution by making sure we have online learning readiness surveys and tutorials. We have mentoring and counseling options, tutoring and writing support, library services, accessibility. And then you can see online proctoring, but there was a, an interesting article around in academic integrity just yesterday, uh, rethinking assessment equity and academic integrity. And I put the link in the chat for you all because there's an open debate about the, the value of uh, different academic integrity technologies and how they sometimes negatively impact some of our learners and that can become an equity issue. The third area I wanted to talk about of those eight in the rubric is representation. And for those who might not be familiar with image and representation bias, it's called, it's whether or not our students can see themselves in the course materials at their institution. And so um, that could be along um, ethnicity lines, age, um, orientation, a variety of ways. But there is literature out there that shows that students of color may see less value for learning in the materials if they don't have 
anyone in them, in those materials, course materials that represent them or include models for them. Um, so there are different ways that we can support students by promoting diverse representation or discussing either the diversity or lack of diversity that represented in the, in the course materials or in our fields. And so we've got here a tiny CC link of the um, a list of galleries that focus on uh, diversity. So I will just type it in the chat here. And basically there, I just went through the web and found somewhere between 15 and 20 image libraries or galleries. Some of them are free, some of them are for fee, but it allows us to create class materials uh, that represent the students that we have in our courses. And so whether it's women in the sciences, whether it's people of color in business and leadership settings, um, there's a lot of ways that we can make sure that our students feel that they are represented. And at the institution level, we need to think about how we're representing our students in our campus promotional materials on our websites. And so here's um, a quote from a student survey. I think it would be nice to have a group for students in our classes, but we don't appear in the promotional materials. And so the students who are older um, want to know that they are um, part of the community that's learning together. And so we need to take that into consideration when we're um, putting together materials that represent all of the students at our institutions. So I talked a little bit about thinking outside the box. And if you're using Canvas as your course learning management system, that box could be the little tile you click to get into the course. But there are so many different ways that students interact with our campuses beyond the course. And we need to do what we can to support them with these different equity-based challenges um, from those other points of contact. Um, we know, uh, again, Dr. Henry, her work revolves around creating a, a better student journey. And so we're all involved in our students' success in some way, shape, or form, even if it's tangentially or indirectly from behind the scenes. If we're keeping a server running, we're helping that student. But uh, I encourage us all to be thinking outside the box when we think about equity. It's not just a classroom a phenomenon. So um, the same question that uh, Dr. Henry had at the end of her uh, little portion here, what is something that you can change in your course or at your institution to improve equity? Love to see those thoughts uh, ripple through the chat as we get move toward the uh, the Q&A segment of our program here. So I'm going to hand the talking stick back over to our host with the most. Uh, Gloria, take it away. Okay, thank you both for excellent presentations. Um, I've seen one uh, question and it looks like a couple of people have tried to answer and it's asking for the link to uh, the faculty development course on Canvas Commons. Um, if we can post that in the chat. And then uh, I'll ask Norma if there's any questions that have come in through Feedloop. And uh, Michael Greco would like to see more discussion about representation in the students' fields in our courses and with student success coaches. Yes, and thank you for the link to the Peralta online equity training. You bet. So what should we tackle first? And Dr. Henry, how about, would you like to start? Sure. Can you repeat the question again? OK. Uh, so uh, Michael, uh, it's more of a comment. Uh, more discussion about representation in the student field in our courses and with student success coaches. So uh, one of the opportunities for us in dealing with our students, and I speak uh, as a woman of color uh, that have, I've worked at uh, HBCU institutions, as well as private and public uh, institutions of learning. 
And one of the things that I think is critically important is to make sure that there are minority people of, uh, represented that serve students. And I say this because oftentimes, if students do not see people who look like them through their experience, this gives them another reason to leave the institution. The second thing is that happens, and, and I know this firsthand because where I've worked with minority populations, they are often drawn to me. And I am able to spur and encourage them and they have pursued other degrees because they feel the can do and they feel a connection to someone that looks like them that have already, that has accomplished what they're seeking to accomplish. Or maybe they never even thought about, you know, pursuing beyond an undergraduate degree, but because they see someone like me, students then have this uh, feeling that they can do it too. I hope that answers your question. Oh, and then to add to the component around coaching, there also has to be people, and I think that it's, even in those instances, I think it is more about having someone that has a heart for coaching, the heart to help students succeed. And I have served in roles where I've coached students. And one of the things that I did quite often in the online environment is send inspirational quotes. And one day I was, and, and this is it, it, a, a chance incident, I was at church and I was talking about some of the work that I did, um, you know, at my university. And there was actually a student that was in our online program. And she said that those inspirational quotes that I sent on a, uh, and I usually would send them three times a week was the difference maker between her staying in college and leaving college, so. That's awesome, thanks. Anything you wanted to add to that, Kevin? And I think she covered it very well, but the only things that I would add um, for those who are seeking more information um, in my own course on helping students learn how to learn, uh, I enriched the conversation around growth mindset when I went beyond just presenting Carol Dweck and her colleagues' views. And then I included Dr. Uh, Luke Wood from San Diego State, who's an African-American male who started Black Minds Matter with his colleagues. Um, he talks about how, although we want to praise effort, we need to let students of color believe they have the ability to succeed because they may not have heard that the same way other student demographics have. So, and then I also include uh, Angela Lee Duckworth, who talks about grit. And I include Anindya Kundu, who talks about agency, uh, something that Dr. Henry brought up earlier. So that the fact that I'm providing diverse perspectives on the same topic means that students may be able to see themselves in the content a little better. And uh, I encourage all instructors to find ways to do this, whether it's a computer science instructor like my colleague at San Francisco State who created a glossary in the learning management system and has examples of computer scientist contributions from every type of person known to humankind, uh, whether it be um, LGBTQ or someone of color or um, females and males and everything uh, on the planet. So thinking about ways that we can help students see themselves in our field. And even if you're using a textbook that isn't very representative, having a discussion about it, having students take that agency and find images that they would like to see that represent them in their field, having uh, guest speakers come in that do allow them to see people like them in the field. Um, those are the types of things that we can, we can do at the course level and at the institution level, then you can pull in student life professionals and those coaches with heart as Dr. Henry brought up as well. And I do uh, like, oh, go ahead, I'm uh, so sorry. I was, that's okay, I'll, I'll get <laughs> right back to you. Uh, Kevin, there's a request if you could post the, the names of those authors um, that you mentioned uh, regarding growth mindset. Okay, you bet. Regina, back to you. 
Uh, yes, and I was just going to add to uh, Kevin's point. Uh, when I was in the traditional classroom, that is one thing that I did quite often because I was a female professor. I would bring in male professors, um, not male professionals, but male professionals into the classroom because I knew that it was important for my students not to just see a female teacher, but also to hear things from the male prof um, professional who's working in the field. That just gives that student a way to connect. And oftentimes those professionals professionals would share the emails that came from the students after those sessions. And I will say everything that you can do to help students feel genuinely connected to the learning community from the smallest things, like I said, just the the um, weekly um, oh, affirmation statements that I would send to students is a difference maker. Making yourself available, one of the things, because I do teach a class online right now, I just have open, open forms. I'm gonna be here for an hour. I'm gonna talk about the assignment that's coming up. And I'm also going to spend some time asking, answering any other questions that you have about the content, about what's coming next. Those things are difference makers for students. So it's a lot of times, it's just the little stuff that makes a difference. Great. Uh, there's a question uh, from, from Russ Pulin. Do you have advice for successful assessment design for courses where you know or suspect that there will be mobile only students? So assessment design strategies for those that are, are students that are mobile only. One yes. of the things that I would say is if the course is online, one of the things that you always want to try to focus on in the design practice is to make sure that it is mobile friendly. I think Kevin talked about earlier where a student didn't have access to Microsoft Word or to save the document in a certain way because they were homeless. So you have to think about, and I will say homelessness is a real thing for students. And, you know, when I've worked on in where I'm at now currently and at other universities that I've worked at, I've had students reach out and say, hey, I just I just lost my home. So when we're designing, that's another equity component. So you want to design with that. What if what if a student becomes homeless? Can we make sure that this course is mobile accessible? If they've got to take a quiz, if you know, for a formative practice, or if they have to write a paper, what tools can a student use on mobile, you know, from a mobile device that still allows them to be successful in the learning community? And I would uh, just add to that again, it's tough following you, Dr. Henry. <laughs> you have so many great things to say. Um, if we think about universal design for learning, how many of you in the room are researchers? Y or N in the chat? Are you a researcher or not? Or have some research experience? If you're familiar with the concept of research, we often try to triangulate, right? One study is not enough to show that something is true or not true. What we do in an equity challenge for some students is when we provide them with one chance, one high stakes exam, one high stakes project to show that they've met the learning outcomes from our course, or maybe two. That's a way to increase anxiety. We Again, we're looking at ways that we can support our students. So for, for my class, I have three week modules in the first week, they watch some mini lectures and they take a quiz. It's not worth many points, but it helps them get a foundation of the ideas we're gonna be discussing. Then we have discussion forum where they have small groups and then they summarize those small group discussions. And then they write a plan. How am I gonna apply one strategy from this particular three week project? And then two weeks later, they write a reflection. This is how it went applying the concept. So now I've given them a quiz, a discussion, and a plan and reflection pair of essays that are worth different numbers of points. 
but allows me to see, oh, the student didn't do so well in the quiz. Maybe they weren't paying attention, but they really made some salient points in the discussion forum. And I loved what they tried in their, in their plan and their reflection, where they actually used something from my class for another class for a work-related training or at home when they were trying to teach themselves how to fix the sink or make Indian food. So thinking about universal design for learning, it means that we wanna provide students with multiple pathways to show what they know. And in the assessment sense, that could be something as simple as, hey, you're giving an essay test, well, let's give them three questions about the same topic and they can pick, pick which one they relate to the most. Or it could be something like, well, you could write an essay or you could um, write a draft essay and then give a small presentation using SlideShare or Prezi or something like that. So you're, you're allowing students with a mobile device to interact in the ways that make most sense. And again, I encourage all of us, and I think Dr. Henry said this as well, to try going through your own class using that view as student button in the learning management system and try to do your own activities with your smartphone and see how easy it is. Because if you run into problems, you know that your students will too. Kevin, you're incredible. It's just <laughs> like you're opening my lid and pulling, <laughs> pulling some of the other ideas that I would add to the conversation. So very good. All right, those are excellent answers. Um, I have a question, um, mostly uh, to Kevin, but actually to either of you. Uh, during the pandemic, many instructors turned to a flexible deadline as a strategy to increase equity for students as part of an assessment process. How can instructors increase flexibility for their students without increasing their own workload or decreasing academic rigor? What I will say is that when you experience something as life altering as the pandemic, students were caring and caring for and teaching their children at home. They were potentially caring for someone that had COVID. And so when things like that happen, it requires flexibility. That goes back to that having that compassion for what's going on in the student's life. Because when a student doesn't make a submission on time, doesn't mean they didn't have time. Oftentimes it means that some life situation has averted them from accomplishing what they want to accomplish. And one of the things that I always say is no one enrolls in a course to fail. So what supports can I provide to you? And one of the things that I do very early in, in my course, it, the first week of class, um, before the, actually before the class starts, a couple of days before the class starts, I send them my self-imposed expectations. And I have a list of 10 items that I say that I am going to, I am committed to providing to my students. One of those things is being there, being an active advocate and support for them. Another thing that I ask them at the end is I say, will you rock with me? Meaning, will you stay with me to the end? And if you're going to stay with me to the end, know that I am committed to supporting your success. And so when you're committed to supporting success, one of those things is, if life happens to a student, how can I be flexible so that I am saying or showing them that I am committed to their success? So that would mean that, yeah, the assignment was due on the first. Okay, you didn't get it in. But as a faculty member, if I have a heart for my student, I'm going to have some flexibility. And that means that if the deadline is the first, maybe I have another seven days that I give them to submit the assignment. And although there may be a penalty, according to the circumstance, maybe I don't penalize the student. So 
if if you're building in again that's that universal design even in testing if you're giving an hour and it's 50 questions maybe you give an hour and 50 minutes but be flexible so that you're helping students succeed great point Okay, we're uh, just a couple of minutes before our end of our time, and we'll end with Kevin's response to this question. Uh, I would just add a little bit to think about your own health and sanity. <laughs> and so there's a, there's a continuum from completely inflexible to infinitely flexible. And we're hearing stories about instructors who chose to be as flexible as possible and ended up having to grade large number of students and a large number of assignments all at the end of the semester because those students just struggled, 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 but then dumped everything into the basket at the very end of the semester. That's, that's not equitable for the instructor and for some instructors, um, that can be a reason that they will no longer <laughs> continue on their path, right? And so there are a number of strategies out there. Dr. Henry's uh, are um, amazing, and I, I think I'm going to have to take your class now. Um, but thinking about ways that you can put some structure around that flexibility, everybody gets a pass where you can turn in an assignment late. It's intentional and you have to communicate with me because it's students who are ghosting the instructors and it, it may be for very good reasons. They are in another country attending a funeral or something like that. But the more th that you ask students to just stay in communication with you, the more you can have that flexibility and demonstrate caring. I love the work of um, Michelle Pakansky Brock in the California Community College System where she talks about being a warm demander. You can demonstrate caring and still have high expectations. You just have to establish that level of trust first and um, then the flexibility can follow. Thank you both for uh, these excellent presentations and this has been a great discussion on equity. Um, I, I look forward to diving more into uh, many of these resources and uh, I'll turn it over to Norma if there's anything we need for wrapping up. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your sessions, everybody. No, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this session and a huge thank you to our Lightning Talk presenters and moderators, especially during that uh, little bit of a technology glitch we had <laughs> at my end. Everything froze. Couldn't do anything. So thank you, Kevin, for sliding right in. And yeah, great over. flexibility. <laughs> there you go. Well, um, it's happened before. A session before, feedback right? survey should be popping up in your feed loop window. We really appreciate if you'll take some time and fill that in for us. The speakers enjoy receiving that feedback. We did uh, record the session. Hopefully the whole thing is recorded. There's not that glitch in the middle. Um, and if that's so, it should be available fairly shortly later today or tomorrow or something like that um, for your asynchronous viewing. But please join us for uh, some fun and casual 30 minute networking lunch beginning at 1130 Mountain Time. Um, the live participants will be entered into a drawing for a $75 Amazon gift card. So we really encourage you all to be there. Great networking opportunity. And once again, thank you to everyone for, for making this just a wonderful presentation. And uh, we'll hopefully see you all at lunch. Thank you.